first speaker is Dr. Ray Shaheen. Ray uh, was chief resident at Stanford when he uh, was diagnosed with MS. He uh, is the founding director of the Vane and Vascular Center in, at El Camino Hospital in Mountain View, which is just down the street from where I practice. And I've known about Ray for a long time. Uh, he uh, was a vascular surgery fellow at Northwestern. He's board certified in vascular surgery. And he's going to sort of give you an idea, his personal experience, but also a little lecture on bridging the gap between doctor and patient. Right? Really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And again, thanks to Sharon and the whole CCSVI Alliance for setting this up, and Viva for uh, allowing us to actually put this concurrently with the Viva conference. Um, and as Dr. Dake suggested, absolutely, I'm a vascular surgeon. I have a broad practice. Uh, I don't uh, do um, <clears throat> CCSVI interventions, but as a vascular surgeon, obviously, I'm busy with uh, vein care, a venous angioplasty and stenting. So I, but I'm also a patient, obviously, and so I have a unique perspective. And uh, so my my uh, role tonight is really uh, going to be provide you uh, some patient journey uh, experience as well as uh, try to bridge that gap a little bit about how I see things from my perspective, since I do a lot of uh, similar. Uh, as Dr. Dake suggested, I, I was a chief resident at Stanford, and, after, and as MS, uh, frequently we, we know that it, it tends to hit classically young people in the stride of life. And I was this invincible surgery resident, young, healthy male, never going to the doctor, and uh, barely getting sleep and food. And uh, you know, my wife was pregnant with, three, with our first child, uh, and chief resident, uh, and uh, matched in my fellowship with everything looking forward. And I had this uh, disabling ataxia vertigo and nystagmus and uh, facial palsy. And, uh, you know, I was struggling through that for two or three days, uh, thinking I had a flu-like illness, kind of in denial. My whole team was worried about me, and I uh, uh, had to leave a liver resection and stumble down to the emergency room to finally uh, figure out what was wrong. Uh, suffice it to say, I got appropriate treatment and uh, took a month off, recovered. Uh, and my objective was to be a vascular surgeon. And, uh, um, so what I did is I, I went in survival mode and uh, took it light on the weekends and called and, and just did cases and, and uh, the, the program was supportive and I got through and I was able to get to my fellowship um, with the one little bump in the road in April of my fellowship year. But we uh, uh, switched me from Adamex to Beta Seron and, and since then, thank God, I've had a, a remarkably uh, benign course over the last several years. Which, as an MS patient, sometimes I feel guilty because I, every time I see people who don't have my course, uh, it makes me feel grateful for what I have. But at the same time, we know that the disease is so unpredictable that every day is a blessing. You've got to count what you got. People can go 10, 20, 30 years and then fall off the curve. So as long as things are good and as long as we're trying to make things better, I think we'll take every day uh, in that light. Uh, and then recently, and consistent with this talk and, and my interest, I recently just got imaged myself. Uh, to uh, and the results are still pending, so I'm like a patient too. I'm still waiting for the doctor to give me those results. Um, I, I do have to pay respects to my academic father, Dr. Ron Stoney, who's over here on the right hand side. He's also the cool guy with the shades. And he's like probably a 30 year old. He's with the icon of surgery, uh, Dr. Jack Wiley, who has the first vascular surgery certificate. These were this was the first vascular surgery program in the country at UCSF, and Dr. Stoney was right there all along. He he also is an MS patient, and when I was uh, diagnosed and I didn't know really what was going to happen with my unborn child, my family, my wife, and my career, uh, my, my chief uh, of the department, Dr. Christopher Zarens, introduced me to Dr. Stoney, and uh, that was just a gift because doc, I, I, I really didn't know what was going on, but I, I just held on to complete faith and said, if he, this man can do it for 30 years, I'm going to do it, and uh, so I, I really owe my career to this uh, this mentor and father. Now, I put this picture in, obviously, it's my family. That's my wife, Blanche, Natalia, and Anthony. Um, and just to show kind of, this is the face of MS. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to help patients. We're trying to keep them happy and healthy and vibrant and being able to take care of their families. And uh, uh, I, I thought that was important to show you. That's my, my journey and my perspective. I'm, I'm going to try to leave some of the high, hard uh, science and where we're heading from the, uh, the team here as we get go with the further lectures, but um, I just did want to say that for some of you out there, you, 
uh, may not be really familiar what venous insufficiency is, and I just want to touch on a couple small items. Um, and so what we're doing is we're going, and classically in surgery, we go from known to unknown. We say, well, we don't know about this, but we know about this, and we're trying to see if there's correlations between what we know and what we don't know. So if you take an example from the legs, which is where we really have a good uh, historical understanding of venous insufficiency, we talk about normal veins having unidirectional flow away from the feet back to the heart. Uh, when, when patients have a leaky valves or venous reflux, <coughs> the blood can go in bidirectional direction and actually uh, cause venous hypertension uh, in the legs. And the manifestations of venous hypertension or venous uh, obstruction can be bulging varicose veins and a whole clinical spectrum of disease. Uh, of particular note, you can actually have some hemocidrin or iron staining in the legs and, uh, and that has also been shown in, in some MS patients obviously to see some iron staining in the brain. So this idea of venous, you know, chronic venous insufficiency in the legs, there may be some uh, idea of correlations between the two. Uh, I, this is supposed to represent my uh, model of flipping, it, flipping that previous diagram around and showing you the directions of the valves being oriented differently for veins that are in the neck. So if you're in the neck and you're above the heart, the flow is going to want to go down, back down towards the heart. And if you have leaky valves, you may have some bidirectional flow, but what we really are concerned about is if you have a stenosis or a narrowing here so that the, the gravity can't really easily bring that blood back down to the heart. So, you know, we're all here to learn, and I'm here to learn too, because I, although I am a doc, I'm a patient, this is a new expanding field, and even the experts don't know a lot, and we're trying desperately and rapidly to gain all this information. So, as I think through this as a doc and as a patient, I'm, I'm thinking about being this hypertension. Is this really chronic cerebral spinal venous insufficiency, or is it really venous hypertension? I, I don't know. Uh, I, uh, you know, the things that favor a, a, a value of, his, of hypertension would be that the fact that you may have some reflex stenosis and some iron deposition, which we know can cause be caused in the legs. Things that go against that is gravity should definitely decompress those veins normally, as long as there's not an obstruction, and with a stenosis that would be an obstruction. Um, Frequently people ask, well, what's the timing of uh, CCSVI? Is it an early thing, an early event in the process, or is it a late event in the process? So in other words, is it, if it's early, it's something we might think is causing this disease or contributing to it, or is it a late finding, it's just a byproduct and an effect? So is it a cause or an effect? Um, <clears throat> importantly, this impairment in the flow in the CCSVI, can it be utilized as a biologic switch in MS such that intervention can modulate or improve the clinical outcome for patients. We know that we look for these targets all the time in medicine, right? We look for like hormone receptors and hormonally responsive cancers, and we just uh, give them um, <clears throat> hormone blockers like tamoxifen or something to shut down those tumors. Uh, I did three years of research to target blood vessels to kind of inhibit cancer tumors, and that's where I got my interest in vascular. But uh, so we can target cancer therapy by um, by blocking these blood vessels. And the, the question is, if you have a blood, blood vessel that's narrow and you open it up, you're not medically targeting that vessel, but you're either interventionally or surgically targeting that vessel. So the idea is, could this represent a disease-modifying therapy too? You know, one model is, um, you know, we have these, these medical disease-modifying therapies, right? We all know Avidex, beta serone, Copax, Ovibit, Tisabri, and others that are all coming down the pipe. But is this an interventional disease modifying therapy? Uh, and, and there are, the most standard way, of course, is a percutaneous balloon angioplasty, or PTA. And in some uh, significant, small, small cases may require stenting. And uh, there may be even a role for surgically opening it up and patching it if, uh, if uh, angioplasty is multiply recurrent or problematic. Um, obviously, everybody's on board and holding hands with this, that we, we, what, we, what we do want is we want a safe procedure. That's what neurologists want. That's what vascular surgeons want. That's what intervention <laughs> want. Patients want. And um, of course, when I say here procedure restricted to dedicated high volume centers, we want the procedure not to have a bad rap by having a bunch of uh, small little hospitals who are trying to market so that they can generate cash and volume to do procedures and they may not very, be very uh, standardized or skilled, you want to go for the obviously the dedicated high volume centers.
And we, we're, there's a lot we need to do to standardize treatment because across the country, um, uh, there's really not um, an established norm for exactly um, how big the balloon should be, how, how much pressure we should be using, and a lot of these other ancillary uh, tools that we can use to uh, determine how good of a result we have. Um, and like anything, we treat patients, not x-rays. We don't treat lesions, we treat patients. So we need to keep that in mind that we're, you know, we're, we're trying to identify if someone is anatomically has CCSVI. But at the same time, we want to evaluate the patient, treat the patient comprehensively from head to toe. Um, and then some guiding principles. Obviously, the goal, uh, we need, this may be provocative, but I'm saying that the goal should not be to effectively just stop an effective medical treatment. Uh, by trying to get a uh, CCSVI treatment. It's really to see if this is added value, if this can, we can add this, add this to your, your therapy uh, in selected cases. And, and, and not everybody is on a medical disease modifying therapy, or they failed it, or they, they can't be on it. So in those cases, that's where CCSVI can even play the treatment that they have available to them. Um, uh, you know, this idea of don't get treated without your neurologist being involved. Uh, you know, we, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but we're just basically saying that you, we don't want patients living in the closet or being shy or afraid to be open and honest with their doctors about what they're excited about and what they want to learn about and what they want to see. So, you know, being up, the best time to engage them is before, not after you've gotten treated. You know, uh, I've, I've had patients come to me and say, oh, uh, two months ago I got this vascular surgeon did this bypass on my leg, and I'm like, oh, okay. Am I the vascular surgeon or is he the vascular surgeon? I'm not really sure. Am I responsible? Who's taking care of me? You know? So I've been in that situation. I can imagine some of the neurologists might be in that situation too. We need to be aware of that. Um, and if we want them to get on board, get these clinical trials off board, and get um, um, the, the neurologic testing and assessments as a part of it all, be an integral part of it, um, them uh, finding out about it late or after the fact or not for these dysfunctional relationships sometimes that may exist, is not going to be a healthy thing. Um, <clears throat> and then the last, just the last, this is actually my last slide here. So just a comment about medical tourism. Uh, you know, obviously you want to pick a, a high volume quality regional center, but place close enough so that you can get surveillance and not feel like you have to fly across the country every time you need to get some imaging. So there's no barriers to getting the appropriate follow up that you need. And with having said that, I think. I'll, I really want to uh -oh. stop talking for the rest of you guys the rest of your talk. So, thank you. Uh, I'm pro I, my intention is to wait till he's about 18 or 20 and, and, and see if I can come close to that. <laughs>